All right. Hello, students. Welcome to another lecture, video lecture for ComSci One Two Five operating systems. And uh, in this lecture, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, semaphores. But before we proceed to this topic, let's uh, discuss what we've learned so far in this uh, unit. So we are in the uh, concurrency. Concurrency unit of this in our, in our textbook, and basically we discuss about threads. The main idea of uh, having threads is that when we write programs, we can have different multiple flows of execution within a process. So essentially, we are interested in multi-threading, and we discuss some uh, issues with threads we talked about uh, the issue on the race condition we said that in some problems some threads multiple threads might access shared data and the shared data might uh, result uh, when, uh, when several threads update a shared data a shared variable shared memory they might result in inconsistencies in the final value. And we've discussed uh, some solutions for this in the previous chapter, where we talked about locks, where we have two, two functions, lock and unlock. And we also talk about uh, condition variables when we would like to synchronize two threads when we have a parent or the main thread waiting for a child thread or a new thread to finish first before the main thread continues its its execution so that's what we are so uh, where we are so far and uh, today we're going to look at a more the more generic primitive for synchronization called semaphore which can both be used as in a similar manner as locks and uh, condition variables let's get started so let's start with the definition of uh, a semaphore so semaphore is nothing more than uh, an integer it's nothing more than a, a, an integer value an object with an integer value and there are two functions two operations that we can call on a semaphore the first one is sem sem weight and the other one is sem post in a similar manner that we did in locks and uh, condition variables we need to initialize a semaphore object using the function uh, sem uh, in it. Let's take a look at the man page of this function. So it says here that it initializes an, a named semaphore with three parameters a uh, pointer to a semaphore object, shared. Uh, the shared argument indicates whether this semaphore is to be shared between the threads of a process or between processes so usually it's set to zero and the initial value of uh, a, sem a semaphore so if p shared has the value zero then the semaphore is shared between the threads of a process right and then this will be the initial value of uh, the semaphore Going back, so this is how we initialize uh, uh, this uh, semaphore. So this, uh, so if we have a variable s here, which is a semaphore object, so we put in address of s and then set to zero the p shared parameter and then 
we set the initial value uh, to 1. So that's fairly easy how to initialize a, a semaphore. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, which is how do we interact with a semaphore. So essential to the use of the semaphore is the semweight function. So the same weight function uh, works like this. So this is a pseudocode of the same weight function. Uh, it accepts a parameter s. What it does is to decrement the value of the semaphore, okay, and uh, by one, and then it will wait if the value of the semaphore uh, is negative. When you say wait. The, the calling process or the calling thread, the thread that called uh, sem weight will wait or will sleep. Right? So, what are the conditions that mu must be met or must be considered in inside sem weight? The first one is if the value of the semaphore was one or higher when called, uh, sem weight will uh, return. Uh, right away so it will not uh, it will not put the calling uh, thread to sleep as shown here and uh, it will suspend the thread or it will put the thread to sleep okay if the value is uh, negative and essentially the the thread okay, the value the, the value of the thread if it is negative will represent the number of threads that are queuing on that particular semaphore let's take a look at the man page for semi so as you can see this is the one page okay. Uh, sem weight decrements semaphore pointed to by sem if the semaphore's value is greater than zero then uh, the decrement proceeds and the function returns immediately if the semaphore currently has the value zero then the call blocks until either it becomes possible to perform the decrement okay, so essentially that's uh, what the sem weight uh, function does. And the second the function is the sem post function. The sem post uh, works like this, so it accept it has a again the parameter semaphore and it increments the value of the semaphore s by one and if there are one or more threads waiting then it will wake wake up that thread it simply increments the value of the semaphore nothing fancy about that and if there's a thread waiting to be woken it wakes one of them so these are uh, pretty simple mechanisms sem weight and uh, sem post, but the more interesting part here is the sem weight because it uh, the calling thread sleeps if the value of the semaphore is uh, negative. So let's now look at the example uses of semaphores in solving the issues associated with concurrency. Let's start with the use of semaphores as locks or binary semaphores. We can actually remember that when we talk about uh, locks, we have uh, two functions. We have the lock, the lock function, and then we enter the critical section, and then we call the unlock function. So this is the typical usage of locks. 
as we discussed previously. Now in the same manner, we can use a semaphore like this. First we define, uh, we initialize a semaphore and then we wait. This is equivalent to the lock and then we enter the critical section and then the same post is the equivalent of the unlock. Now the question is what should be the value of x because we need to initialize the semaphore. So the answer should be uh, 1. So it should be 1. When we, when, if we want to use a semaphore as a lock we have to set the initial value to 1. Why is that? So, I guess the, the best way to do that is to uh, trace the execution of, uh, of this uh, binary, binary lock or binary semaphore. So let's start uh, this particular thread trace. Here we are given two threads, uh, thread 0 and uh, thread 1. And initially the value of the semaphore is 1 because as we said it should start with 1 then if thread 0 calls same way so still the value of the semaphore is 1 and then uh, since the value of the semaphore is 1 as, as discussed as described here if uh, decrement the value of the semaphore so uh, what it does is after decrementing uh, the value which becomes now zero same weight simply returns it does not uh, wait okay because uh, waiting will happen only if the value of the semaphore is negative so currently the value of the semaphore is zero so the same weight function will simply return and then thread zero cannot enter the critical section retaining the value of the semaphore zero okay, and eventually it will call same post which will simply increase the value of the semaphore by one and after exiting this thread after finishing this thread zero then the value of the semaphore is now 1 again. So this is just uh, a single thread using the semaphore. Now let's take a look at the behavior or the changes on the value of changes in the behavior okay, if we have two threads that are actually calling on or using the semaphore. So initially we have the value uh, one for the semaphore and we have thread zero running uh, thread one on the other hand is still in the ready state it's not yet running so thread zero will call same weight it will decrement zero now since the value of the semaphore is still non-negative same weight will simply return and then thread zero can enter its critical section uh, it can start its critical section. However, while in its critical section, the scheduler uh, gains control and it switches the currently running process to thread 1. So what will happen is thread 0 will be in the ready state and thread 1 now will be in the uh, running state. Now, thread 1 will call same way. So when thread1 calls same weight, currently the value of the semaphore is zero. So it will, uh, thread1 will decrement that, or the semaphore will, be, the value of the semaphore will be decremented. So it will be negative. So with this decrement, the behavior is to put thread1 to sleep. Okay. Because as shown, as uh, described here, if the value is negative, the calling thread will be put to sleep. So as you can see here, 
the calling thread which is thread 1 will be put to sleep so the uh, take note that there are three process states that are being mentioned here we have running we have uh, we have uh, we have running here we have ready and we have sleeping and uh, what happens is when thread one is now sleeping then there might be a context switch and thread zero will begin execution and what will happen is uh, it will continue the execution in its critical section with the value of the semaphore still negative one then eventually it will thread zero will call sem, uh, sem post which will increment the value of the semaphore negative one to zero okay. and then uh, based on the behavior of se uh, sem post if there are more threads waiting we will wake one so as you can see here we have thread one which is waiting so what will happen is after incrementing the semaphore value it now becomes zero it will wake uh, thread one and then sem post will return and then there will be since uh, thread zero is done already then control will transfer to the scheduler and it will select another process which uh, basically since there are only two threads it will just be uh, thread one and uh, after this after this sleeping okay, uh, same weight will now return and then it can now enter uh, thread one can now enter its critical section and then it will call same post and then uh, it will uh, the same post will return and we have achieved what is shown what what is shown here is that we were able to achieve the desired effect of using lux in the manner that uh, we did it using the lux primitive this time we only use the semaphore primitive so you can think of the semaphore as a multi-purpose uh, synchronization primitive wherein at this point as in the lecture we've shown that it can be used as uh, lux so now maybe we can take a look at some code from the OSTEP uh, code so you have here let's say what we have, do we have here Mm. Right, let's look at join so this is the join that uh, C code what it does is okay so it uses the uh, same weight and same post as uh, no, I think this is for the condition variable. Let's uh, take a look at binary. And this is the binary semaphore. Okay, so yeah, so this is the binary semaphore, and uh, it is used as uh, locks here, as a lock, as a lock here. So here we have. Uh, so this is the semaphore. Uh, take note that it is uppercase here so I mentioned in the previous uh, lecture that they have a library that protects this one uh, just to uh, re, uh, to reiterate that okay so so this is the sem init so it's basically just a hash define and sem comma value so basically it eliminated the uh, zero here so shorthand okay. so that you won't get confused in this example okay, 
So let's take a look at the binary that C. So we have a semaphore here. Okay, we use as a mutex or salak. Then we create two threads, thread one and thread two, thread C1 and thread C2. And then uh, join C1 and C2 and then print the result. Now, the way it is used here is like this. So this is the lock and this is the unlock part and this is the critical section. So let's try to uh, test this one. Builds everything. Uh, so let's run binary. Right? So binary is the code supposedly for, uh, okay, for the lock. And you can see that the result is uh, the expected result because of the mechanism. Uh, because we use the semaphore as a form of a lock. Okay, so. That's for uh, the use of uh, a semaphore as a form of uh, a lock. Let's continue. Now, let's uh, take a look at how to use semaphores as uh, condition variables. So recall that condition variables uh, is a form of a queue because we would like let's say uh, uh, a parent or a main thread to wait for a child thread to finish first before uh, proceeding so this is how a condition variable will be uh, how a semaphore will be used as a condition variable so as you can see uh, we define the semaphore here s and then what we want to achieve is that we want uh, the parent to wait for the child, the main thread, to wait for the for another thread to finish first before it outputs uh, the parent end. So, in a similar manner that we did in the condition variable, so here we create the child thread, and then what we do is to simply call sem weight on the semaphore and then uh, here on the child we call uh, uh, sem post so this is equivalent to signal and uh, signal and weight okay, in the condition variable so the interesting question here is what should be the initial value of the semaphore in the in the use of the semaphore as a lock the initial value of the semaphore is one here if we use the semaphore as a condition var a variable as condition variable we need to initialize it to uh, to zero so that's the main difference between the two and again, to be able to understand why we should set it to zero, we can look at the trace so that we can see the exact behavior. Now, there are actually two cases here, two cases presented here. The first one is when the parent calls sem weight. The parent calls sem weight before, uh, before the child has called the uh, send post okay. so these are threads uh, we have the parent thread the main thread and the child thread this is the thread created using p thread create so let's take a look at this one so the semaphore uh, initially is set to zero because if we're going to use it as a condition variable as i said it should set to zero so the parent thread will create the child thread so it's in the running state now we are looking at the case wherein the the parent 
call same way it was able to call same way before the child has called sempo so after thread creation the child thread simply is in the ready state then the parent thread will call same weight so again the behavior of same weight will be to decrement the semaphore the value of the semaphore so from zero it will be uh, negative one now now since the value of the semaphore is negative it will call the parent thread to sleep as shown here and since it is now uh, the parent is now uh, sleeping then there will be a context switch and the child will run now the child uh, as shown in the code is the child thread okay, shown in the thread creation here it will uh, call same post so what same post does is to increment negative one so it will now become zero after the increment and then the behavior of post is to wait any thread waiting on the semaphore so it will wake the parent and then post will return and what will happen is the parent will now be uh, awakened and same weight will now return so the effect is still the same because if you look at the code the printing the printing of uh, the parent will happen here so so it will print uh, it will pr uh, print f here it will print parent here and then uh, it will print child here at this point in in the code right so the sequence is still achieved our desired effect is still achieved now in the second case uh, this is the case wherein the child runs to completion before the parent uh, even calls same way so will we get the same the expected behavior so again uh, at this point the parent will print parent here uh, the parent will print end so we have parent child and so still achieve now here so uh, this in this scenario the parent thread creates the child thread but before the parent thread can call same way the child runs so what happens is the parent will become ready and the child will now be uh, in the running state and then the child will call same post again the behavior of same post is to decre uh, to increment the value of the semaphore now currently the value of the semaphore uh, since the beginning is unchanged so currently it is zero so same post will increment it so it will become one and then it will try to wake threads that are waiting on the semaphore and currently uh, no thread is waiting on the semaphore so it will simply do nothing and it will simply return and then what will happen is the child thread is done and then there will be a context switch and uh, the parent process will now be running okay. and then currently the value of the semaphore is one now when the parent calls same weight remember that same weight will decrement the value so 1 minus 1 will become 0 and uh, since uh, the value of the semaphore is 0 the parent process will not wait right because it's 0 the process the parent process will only wait if the value of the semaphore is negative so it will simply 
uh, proceed and then it will simply return. So uh, here the child runs, it will print uh, child at this point and then uh, end at this point. So again, we were able to achieve parent, child, and, and uh, example. Now let's take a look at the, the code. So I think uh, it was in the join.c. So this is uh, join.c. So this is the code presented in the slide. So we have parent begin and then we have uh, the thread creation here and the weight. Okay. So we have the sem weight and we have the sample. So let's try that uh, to run this. So begin, will not execute, and then we have the child. So all runs that we're going to do in this example will indicate that we are able to achieve uh, the desired behavior of a condition variable wherein the parent or the main thread waits for the child thread to finish first, thus achieving this result and using semaphore as a form of condition variable. So next, uh, okay, so let's move on to the next problem. This is a common problem and this was also discussed in the chapter on condition variables, the producer, consumer, or the bounded buffer problem. So here is a common problem in operating system in computer networks wherein you have a, partic uh, a buffer with a limited amount, uh, a limited size or limited capacity and processes will try to put uh, data on this uh, buffer and eventually this buffer will be full so processes that or threads that would like to write to that buffer can, will have to wait for some time before for available slots to be available before they can put something on that particular buffer. So in this problem, uh, let's uh, describe how uh, this is uh, accomplished. So basically we have uh, two, two types of processes. We have a producer or threads or processes. We have the producer thread and we have the consumer thread and we define a put interface to the producer where it waits for a buffer to become empty in order to put data into it. So we can assume a single slot buffer or we can assume or we can have a multiple slots uh, buffer. Okay. So this will be shown here and it will be max minus one. Okay, so this will be the indices for this buffer. But the idea is that this put interface will uh, put something on the buffer if uh, there's an empty slot on it. Then the consumer thread for the consumer process we have we define a get interface and what it does is to wait for a buffer to become filled before uh, using it. Right? So it cannot consume something that is uh, not, uh, it has no value. So this is the code. Okay? So we have the buffer line one, we have the definition of the buffer. Then we have two variables here, fill and use. What are these variables for? Fill will be used by the put interface shown here. So fill is used as an index uh, into the buffer where to place the next item, okay, to place the next value on. And then fill will be incremented 
by one, and it, uh, it goes back to zero okay, because of this modulo max, so that uh, it can cycle a circular buffer basically. Okay. And then the use uh, will be used to index buffer to retrieve the, the an item from the buffer, and uh, use is also incremented okay, in a circular fashion, and then temp is returned eventually. So this is the interface for the put and get, and these uh, functions will be called by the producer and consumer threads. Now let's take a look at the implementation of the thread function for the producer and the thread function for, for the consumer. Now, before these two functions, there are two semaphores that are defined. The first one is the empty semaphore, and the second one is the full uh, semaphore. And they are used in this manner in the producer. First, uh, we have some number of iterations here. How many iterations? It can, it can be defined uh, globally or some parameters, command line arguments. And then what it does is uh, it waits on, uh, it costs uh, the empty uh, semaphore is basically used by the producer to wait for an empty uh, slot. Okay. So now what is the initial value, the initialization of this semaphores? So let's take a look at the initialization part. So the initialization part, the empty semaphore is set to the maximum value because uh, we have to, because initially all slots in the buffer, all slots in the buffer will be empty. Right? So uh, our producer will have to wait for an empty slot. So we use uh, this empty semaphore here. We wait for an empty slot to be available. And when an empty slot is available, we put in uh, the value and then we post. So remember, wait uh, decrements, post increments. So we increment the full semaphore and the initialization here is that full is uh, the full semaphore is initially set to zero so this is the main uh, logic inside the producer uh, thread function now for the consumer uh, this is how it will look like so again, uh, it will continuously consume until a negative one is uh, obtained. Okay. So uh, what is thus the opposite of is the opposite of the producer. What the producer does. So it waits for some full uh, slots, and then it it gets the value, and then uh, it posts the. Uh, it post on the it calls post on the empty uh, semaphore meaning uh, we have since I've consumed something okay one slot is available okay. so we increase basically we increment the empty number of empty slots okay. and then we print the value so that's how the producer uh, consumer uh, problem is implemented in this manner using semaphores. So this will actually work if we only have uh, this will actually work if we only have uh, one thread, one producer thread and uh, one consumer thread. Okay. Uh, there will be some issues uh, in this implementation, as we will see later. So, uh, I mean, this this implementation will work. Okay, will work only if uh, max is one. Okay, so what uh, what 
uh, what I mean earlier is that uh, if you only have one slot in the buffer then this implementation will work okay? not necessarily if you have just one consumer thread or one producer thread okay when we only have one slot in our buffer okay so this will work we can have multiple threads uh, and multiple consumer and multiple producer threads uh, accessing this buffer no problem at all okay? but an issue will arise when uh, max is uh, greater than one okay? so we have uh, uh, multiple slots uh, here in our buffer so when that happens okay, uh, if there are multiple producers okay, a race condition can happen at uh, line F1 so looking back at the code okay, so line F1 here we have a race condition that can happen here because we have uh, multiple uh, threads multiple producer threads accessing the field value or the field uh, variable so that's the main issue with this implementation so it means that all data on that particular slot okay we have field field variable will be overridden right because uh, that field variable is accessed by several producer threads okay so it's possible that one producer thread is trying to write something on that data then eventually uh, another producer thread gets executed and tries to access the field variable and thus overwriting the data okay so we need to provide some uh, mutual exclusion uh, in the implementation so the filling of a buffer and increment incrementing of the index into the buffer is a critical section problem so uh, this uh, this part here is actually a critical section so we simply introduce uh, we simply introduce uh, locks basically to to this critical section so this is uh, one approach by adding mutual exclusion so almost the same code but this time we added uh, locks okay? locks in this area so first we try to get a lock and then we do this uh, do the same same weight and then we put the value uh, signal that uh, a new slot is uh, available okay and then unlock okay as for the producer it's almost the same so again we added uh, locks on this uh, part of the code so is this correct okay so the question is is this uh, addition of mutex docs correct okay so the problem is okay imagine if we have uh, two threads uh one producer and one consumer thread now the consumer might acquire the mute mutex at line c0 right okay? so this is line and this line c0 so the consumer thread was able to acquire the mutex okay now the consumer calls same weight okay so this is the next line in the consumer this is same weight then uh, the consumer is blocked in yield the cpu so let's say for some uh, for some uh, cases uh, since weight will only uh, will only wait if the value of the semaphore is negative so let's say that is the scenario so the value of the semaphore is negative so the consumer thread will uh, will uh, will go to sleep okay but the problem with that is that when the consumer thread goes to sleep it still holds the mutex right 
So it got it got the lock here. Then, given the system scenario, the the consumer trend slips. Then the lock is still held by the consumer. Okay. <coughs> now, if the consume if the producer calls same way, if the in this let's say we have a producer thread currently being running or scheduled it calls the same way or calls the it tries to acquire the lock okay? the producer uh, will not be able to obtain that lock because uh, that particular lock is being held by the consumer thread which is still sleeping so essentially what we now have is a deadlock the the uh, the consumer thread holds the mutex while the producer thread is trying to access that particular mutex lock but it cannot access that because the consumer thread is still sleeping okay so that's the scenario that we have here so the solution is basically to simply rearrange the code so that you place the locks okay you place the locks although this was mentioned before nearest to the critical section so in this manner we simply reorganize the rearrange the code and place the lock acquisition code this is the lock acquisition and the lock release nearest to the critical section so in this scenario we now have a final uh, working solution so take note that since mutex is used as a lock here its initial value is uh, zero right and then uh, in the, the same values uh, for the empty we have initialized to max and full zero okay so that is the final uh, working solution for 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 the producer consumer problem so maybe it would be better if we take a look at the code so okay producer consumer works maybe I this is the code for the producer uh, consumer so here we have uh, as, as mentioned in the slides so we have the use the field we have the buffer loops we have the max <coughs> we define the maximum to be 10 10 uh, 10 threads uh, consumers one so this is the field this is the equivalent of the put okay this is equivalent of the put function in in the in the slide and do get is the equivalent of the uh, get uh, function instead and we have the producer okay so we have loops uh, and we have uh, the waiting on the empty and the waiting on the mutex okay so it's very the same almost the same as the as the one in the slides and this is the for the uh, end case okay. and then for the consumer right this is uh, the same also and then the main function so we have to specify the uh, max here and the number of loops and the number of uh, consumers so the number of consumers should be less than or equal to 10 we allocate the buffer okay, and then we initialize the buffer to zero here this line here and then we initialize the 
semaphores. And then we uh, create a producer thread here. So producer thread. Uh, and then we create the consumer threads here. Okay. And then uh, P thread join. And then for the uh, for the producer thread and this one for the consumer thread and then uh, return. So again, uh, the argument should be buffer size, uh, number of loops, and the number of consumers. So we have a single producer here. So that slash producer consumer works. So the first argument is this buffer size, let's say five. Uh, number of loops, let's say 10,000. And then the number of consumers, five. So let's see what the result of this execution will be. So this is the uh, output of the code. Okay. So it outputs the name of the thread and then the, uh, the value it got from the from the condition uh, from from the buffer. Okay, so that is for the producer consumer problem. So the next one is the uh, reader writer locks. Okay, so in this uh, problem, we're, uh, we have to imagine as shown here, you have to imagine that we are we have uh, uh, concurrent uh, a number of concurrent list operations, including inserts and uh, simple lookups. So the insert when we insert, let's say we have a list. When we insert something on the list, it will change the state of the list. So let's say if we have uh, a linked list, for example. given let's say we have a head here right so given this list this uh, link list right, if we insert something it will change the state of the list let's say by adding if we insert something at the tail you get uh, a new node then, then so we discussed this uh, in the chapter on concurrent data structure so we can actually have locks for that and then we can also have uh, a lookup operation which simply uh, reads the data, uh, the data structure, let's say printing the, the list, okay? printing the items on the list. So it's basically sim simply reads the data structure as long as we can guarantee that no insert is uh, ongoing, okay? we can actually allow many lookups to proceed concurrently. So, so in this uh, reader writer box, what it does is it allows many threads to read the contents of the data structure. The, the application of this is in databases, for example. You have a database and you have different views on the database. So of course, you don't want uh, the different views to be having uh, different contents presenting different contents right so we can implement what is called the reader and the writer lock because this requirement uh, will allow us to perform to achieve just that allow multiple readers to the data structure whenever there is uh, no insert or no write is going on on the data structure so let's have uh, this uh, in, uh, sam sample implementation here. So the requirements are shown here. So we have we only have a single uh, writer. Okay, so we have a single writer can accord. So only one writer thread will be able to manipulate 
the lock to perform an insert on the latest structure. Uh, once a reader has acquired a read lock, okay, uh, more readers will be allowed to enter the uh, read lock too. That means that if we have one reader that was able to acquire the reader lock, then other readers will be allowed to read the data structure also because that particular since that reader was able to acquire a reader lock that means that there is no uh, writer trying to change the state of the data structure and a writer thus will have to wait a writer will have to wait until all the readers are finished so this is the implementation of that so we have a reader writer lock type here then we have the lock for mutual exclusion then we have a semaphore for the write lock remember we only have uh, one single writer and we have the count of readers reading the critical section. So the implementation for init will look something like this. So init will require a uh, read, reader writer lock type. Initialize the number of readers to zero first. Then this is a mutex lock. So we have the reader, uh, we have the this lock here. Okay. So that's why it's uh, one here okay so the mutex lock and then we have to initialize the right lock okay so this is this will be used by the uh, the writer okay so this is for the initialization now if you have uh, so for the reader the reader will use the this function uh, acquire read lock so what it does is to okay, try to wait. Okay. It will try to wait for uh, try to wait so that it can uh, the reader can gain access to the data structure. Now once successful, the reader count will be incremented, and then if we have one reader. Okay. So that means that we have one successful reader being able to acquire the chance to read the data structure. Then we simply lock the right lock, meaning the first reader will uh, acquire the right lock. Okay. So this means that no writer will be able to uh, acquire this right lock because it is being held by the first uh, reader and then after this uh, it will uh, release the lock the reader writer lock now for the release uh, read lock for the reader this, is, this will be called by the reader what it does again is to uh, again try to acquire the uh, read lock okay, read write lock and then uh, once it acquires that, it uh, decrements the reader count, and uh, if there are no more readers in the data structure, then we release the write lock so that all the waiting writers will be able to acquire this write lock, and then simply sample or release the lock or the general RW lock. Now for the writer, uh, just the basics, so acquire the lock, so simply call same weight uh, write lock, and then for the release the lock, simply call uh, uh, same post uh, write lock. So very clean solution for the reader writer problem, but uh, this implementation suffers from the fairness problem. Why? Because uh, it would be relatively easy for the reader to uh, starve the writer because what will happen is that 
what happens is that once a single writer has acquired the right luck and then there are a lot of uh, readers coming in then essentially since our condition is uh, to release the right luck is when there are no more readers if there are a lot of readers then most likely the writer will never have a chance to get hold of the data structure to perform his insert okay so one solution is to find some mechanisms to prevent more readers from entering the lock once a writer uh, is waiting so once usually you have this try uh try try lock okay so try lock mechanism so that once the once the once a reader is trying to uh, get hold of the right lock or the, the writer uh, no other uh, no additional readers will be uh, allowed to enter right? or because it's a threshold on the number of readers to be allowed uh, per batch right? at a time so there are different techniques for that complicated techniques but might also uh, result in uh, performance degradation so let's take a look at uh, some code for this uh, rw lock so rw lock let's see let's take a look at this code So again, this is the implementation. Uh, so this is the type definition. Uh, this is the initialization. This is for requiring the uh, read lock. And this is for releasing the read lock. And you know, acquiring the write lock and the releasing of the uh, write lock. Okay, so this is the reader thread. So it tries to uh, acquire the read lock. Okay, so we have a local uh, calls counter. This is open here, and then release the lock, and then print the read, read done, and then we have the writer here. So the 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 right uh, the writer uh, basically uh, writes on the counter. So it increments the counter. So here the reader simply reads the value of the counter. And then tries to acquire the right lock, right, right done. And then this is the main program. So usage will uh, will require the RW lock, uh, read loops and write loops. So this this RW lock. So read loops is the okay. So so two parameters: uh, the number of read loops and the number of write loops. Okay and let's see how uh, is that so let's say uh, slash rw lock uh, 10 and 6 uh, is 60 okay. so write down read 60 read 60 read 60 okay so let's say 100 100 okay so all that so this is an uh, example the code for the uh, reader writer uh, locks let's move on to the next uh, problem okay so this problem is called the dining philosophers problem and the assumption is that we have five uh, philosophers sitting around uh, table okay. so we have these philosophers here and between each pair of the philosopher uh, there's a single fork okay so we have different forks here five in total the philosophers uh, each have times where they think and they don't uh, need any forks for that and then there are times when they need to eat where it will require the use of fork so in order to eat the philosopher needs uh, a philosopher needs uh, two forks 
one on his left and one on his right. And uh, basically the problem illustrates uh, a contention for, this, uh, for these forks. So each of these uh, philosophers will try to get hold of, uh, let's say, P1. So we'll try to get hold of F1 and F2 in order to be able to eat. Right? So there will be contention for these forks. So the key challenge in this uh, problem are the following. First, we would like to have a solution when there is no deadlock, meaning every 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 uh, the execution of the simulation will proceed. Right? It will not harm right? basically when you run this program. So the second uh, challenge is that no philosopher starves and never gets to eat. That means that each one, each philosopher will eventually get a chance to eat. And the requirement for being able to eat is being able to acquire the left and right forks. And of course, we also want performance. So we need to have concurrency. We want to have uh, as many, probably as many philosophers doing, being able to uh, do their work. For example, uh, the philosopher should be able to think, meaning both forks are down, and then eat, both forks are in their hands, and they should not be just holding one fork, waiting for the other fork to be available. Okay, so that's what we mean by uh, concurrency is high. So our solution uh, will look something like this. So the philosopher will be in an infinite loop while one and what it does is to think and then get forks then eat and put forks. So it's basically the abstraction that was used in this implementation and we also have uh, helper functions left and right so left will return the uh, fork on the left and right will uh, return the fork on the right of philosopher p so basically the philosophers are numbers are integers so uh, 0 1 2 3 4 as well as the forks so how do we solve this uh, problem using uh, semaphores? So the solution is to use again some semaphores and to represent each fork as a semaphore. So we have an array of semaphores here, five element array forks, which is basically an array of uh, semaphores and we implement we need to implement this get forks and uh, put forks so get forks what we do is to simply wait for the fork on the left and then wait for the fork on the right right because we use these helper functions to uh, help us uh, determine the forks and then put forks will be simply just uh, posting putting down the the left and uh, right forks now this solution uh, there is a possibility of a deadlock okay what will happen is if each philosopher grabs the fork on their left same everyone uh, grab their fork on their left before any philosopher can grab the fork on the, right, on the right. So eventually, there will be a deadlock and that is a problem. So each, uh, each philosopher will be stuck holding one fork and waiting for the other, but eventually it will never happen because the other philosopher is also waiting for 
the form, right? So we have a deadlock. In the next chapter, we're going to characterize in detail uh, this uh, deadlock, what this deadlock is all about. For now, we know that there is a possibility of a deadlock in this implementation because uh, this code here, okay, okay, if all of the philosophers are in this, uh, in this, uh, are executing in this line of code, then they will not be able to uh, get hold of the right form. So the solution is basically to uh, set a different order for at least one of the philosophers to prevent deadlock. So we modify uh, get for and if we are the last philosopher instead of getting the left uh, fork first we get the right fork we try to get the right fork first and then the left uh, fork so this way we try to we are able to avoid the deadlock so essentially what we did is to break the cycle of waiting for the left uh, for the right for the right uh, fork when everyone is holding their left fork already. So again, let's take a look at the code. So we have a lot of dining philosophers code here. So let's take a look at the code with the deadlock. Let's see how it looks like. Okay, so the implementation, uh, define an argument, thread ID here. This will be passed to the thread, I suppose. Then we have the helper functions left and right. Then we have the get forks, same weight, and same for the left and right forks, and the put forks, and then the thing just not does nothing. It does nothing. We simply just print F something here. Then this is the philosopher. So it uh, accepts the argument. So again, you should recall the discussion on how to pass arguments to pthreads. So this one is by using a uh, structure. So inside the thread function, uh, we get the thread ID and then we think this is the loop. Instead of while one here, we indicate the number of loops. And then think, get forks, and then eat, uh, put forks. Okay, so P is the thread ID. And then we have the uh, main program here. So in the main program, we initialize the semaphores, the forks, okay. and then uh, we create the threads. Okay, and this is how we pass the uh, arguments to the the thread function, and p thread join, and then so let's try to run this. Uh, dining philosophers then up. It will record say 10,000 uh, number of loops. So no problem, no deadlock. No problem. But at some point in the execution, uh, this uh, a deadlock will happen. But uh, in this demonstration, say let's increase the number of iterations. So supposedly this should uh, terminate, but uh, probably it will not because uh, at some point during the execution uh, a deadlock has happened already so it will not uh, it will not uh, stop okay so uh, we can uh, uh, observe that in this part so I'll just leave the rest of uh, uh, 
I just leave the leave to you to try the rest of the code here uh, so that you can uh, uh, observe the uh, behavior so perhaps you can look at the Benny philosophers uh, no deadlock implementation so uh, the main difference is this one here right so Let's run the same number of iterations with no deadlock. Okay, so uh, this one runs with the no deadlock implementation, and if you run with the deadlock, the the one with the deadlock, at some point it will hang, right, which the deadlock has happened. But if we use the uh, no deadlock, same number of iterations, uh, basically. Uh, this one finishes successfully without any deadlock happening okay so that's for the dining philosophers problem now uh, let's look at okay so the next uh, item is thread throttling so in this uh, in this uh, item or in this issue uh, we ask the question, how can a programmer prevent uh, too many threads from doing something uh, at once? Because there are scenarios wherein uh, you have a lot of threads and let's say that particular threads or those threads are trying to utilize, let's say, a large chunk of memory in their, in their thread function. So how can we how can we limit the number of threads? So one solution is to put a threshold on the on the number of threads, and we can do that by using a of course uh, a semaphore for the threshold, so that uh, uh, only a limited number of threads will be able to execute inside uh, the code that let's say allocates a large chunk of memory, so that uh there will not, uh, the resources will not be uh, uh, will not run, will not run out run out okay, so that's uh, thread throttling now the last one is how do we implement uh, semaphores right in the previous uh, slides we presented the different uses of semaphores uh, and how we, how we use it to solve different problems. Now, how do we implement uh, semaphore? So, in the textbook, they have an implementation called, uh, which they named uh, as semaphores, and this is how they implemented it. So, they define uh, ZMT, okay, and it has a value, as with the case of the semaphore, and we have a condition variable inside it and we have a lock inside it so recall our chapter on locks and uh, condition variables now for the initialization this is basically just setting the value of the semaphore to some initial value and then uh, initialize the condition variable and initialize the lock now for the weight okay, so recall that the behavior for the weight is it will uh, decrement the value of the semaphore and then it will put the calling thread to sleep if the value after decrementing it becomes negative so let's see, uh, see how that that is implemented here uh, so first uh, it tries to obtain a lock for mutual exclusion because we're trying to uh, access value here okay so we need to obtain the uh, lock here and then we're going to use uh, the condition variable weight which is essentially uh, what we discussed in the previous uh, chapter on condition variable so weight on the condition variable as well as the lock okay. and then 
we decrement the value and then we unblock the mutex lock right so this is the implementation for the for the weight now for the post right so again we, uh, we try to the behavior of the post as discussed previously is to increment the is to increment the value of the semaphore and then weight the thread that is waiting on the semaphore if there are any so first again we try to get the lock for mutual exclusion because we're trying to access the value so we increment that and then this con signal here will wake uh, will wake the thread that is waiting on the that is waiting on the on the queue right so we have on this particular condition variable and then it simply unlocks the 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 mutex after that right so that's basically it very simple implementation of semaphore so however in this implementation uh, it says here that the semaphore semaphore don't maintain the invariant that the value of the semaphore uh, uh, about the value of the semaphore we said last time earlier that uh, if the value of the semaphore is negative the the number represents the number of threads waiting on the uh, on the semaphore right? but uh, that is no longer the uh, that is no longer the case here in this implementation because the value never uh, will never be lower uh, lower than zero so in this implementation that invariant is no longer true so that ends this chapter uh, see you on the uh, next video